good to see you. Central America questions and see, All right. see how I do. Are you happy with the $30 billion you got from the House today? Not completely happy. The cup's half full. Uh, we need the full cup, and uh, we will go back uh, for more. On the Senate side, I understand they didn't ask the full 60 that we'd asked for. I think a lot of Americans wonder if you are getting us into another Vietnam. I think that is the general worry there. Something that's secret and, and we quietly slip in before we realize we're there. Are we? Uh, no. And there is no comparison whatsoever in this situation and Vietnam. And I will be speaking more about this tomorrow night uh, to the Congress. But there's, there is no and never has been any thought or discussion of sending troops any place here in the in the Americas, nor are they asked for or wanted. And uh, three fourths or more of all of the, the aid that has gone down there has been economic aid, and less than one fourth of it has been military aid. But Vietnam started similarly in that country, saying that we had no intention of sending any troops there. We weren't going to get into it. And because of all the debate over secret operations, I think there's a great concern. Do you think there's a point where you well, could tell well, Americans more about what we're doing in Nicaragua, for example? Well, no, look what, look what we had in Vietnam. We had a place that wasn't even named that. It was named uh, French Indochina. And it was part of the decolonizing that uh, began after World War II. And in a meeting of the leading nations, uh, Western world in, in Geneva, it was decided that there would be a North Vietnam and a South Vietnam, and uh, two companies were, countries were created, all sorts of provisions were made as to uh, how they could determine where they wanted to go and so forth. And uh, the people of one country or the other were supposed to be allowed to change if they wanted to. North Vietnam, uh, when a million people crossed over into South Vietnam, preferring that to the communist rule that existed under Ho Chi Minh in North Vietnam. They shut the borders, contrary to the agreement and so forth. But you had there an assault on one country by another. But the advisors that were in there were in there because it was a new country, South Vietnam. They were, for the first time, going to have to have things like their own defense, their own military, and so forth. And we were simply in there trying to help them establish all the things that go with being an independent state. And the uh, invasion from North Vietnam really started, uh, while most people portrayed it as, a, as a, a Viet Cong, a domestic revolution, it wasn't at all. We know now that they were sent in deliberately. They were North Vietnamese forces. But the whole thing was on a totally different basis, to say nothing of being 10,000 miles away, than the situation here of a duly elected government that is being attacked by guerrilla forces that are sponsored by outside countries. But it's the situation in Nicaragua that I think right now is causing so much concern because of the secrecy of what's going on there. Um, is it, do you think there's a po tomorrow night or some point along where, where you can describe more fully what, what we're doing there beyond the trying to intercept well, no, the What I think I will point out is that the difference between El Salvador and Nicaragua is that Nicaragua is a, is a revolutionary government that uh, by force uh, took over the, uh, the governing of Nicaragua. But then you had the internal fight in which 
Uh, many of the revolutionaries were cast aside and uh, the promises that had been made as being the goals of the revolution were never carried out. Our country had tried to do and been trying to uh, get along, negotiate with Nicaragua, but our interest there is because the arms and the training and even the direction of guerrilla military movements are all centered in Nicaragua. The arms are coming into El Salvador by way of Nicaragua. We know that the, the operations of the Salvadoran guerrillas are directed by radio from the capital of near the capital of, of uh, Nicaragua. Well, you, you said in your last press conference that we wouldn't do anything to, to uh, violate the Bowling Amendment. How would you feel if the guerrillas themselves said that their intentions are to overthrow the government there? Well, we can't control what, what they're saying. What we're interested in is preventing this continued military supply and, uh, and training and... Well, can't we control what they're doing with, with our arms, though? What? Can't we control what, what, uh, if they're saying that they're trying to overthrow the, throw the government, can't we control that? Well, as I say, we're interested in making it more difficult, uh, in fact impossible, for Nicaragua to continue to arm the guerrillas in El Salvador. jump for a minute to taxes, another mm -hmm. of your favorite subjects. Now, Howard Baker said yesterday that, or I think it was earlier today, that um, he thought uh, that the Republicans would have to go for about $8 billion to $10 billion in new taxes in order to save the third year of your tax cut and your indexing. If they structured that in such a way that it didn't, that it wasn't an income tax, do you think you could buy it? I just have to say that I think that right now with this recovery, stage it has reached, uh, no one should be talking increased taxes. This would be a good way to uh, set back or cancel out the recovery. But if both, but if, but if the, both Democrats and Republicans are, and you've got the choice between what the Democrats are trying to do with the 30 billion, which could mean no third year tax cut, no indexing. Couldn't you accept something to save that? If they or attempted would you go it, down the road and if they it? attempted it, I would veto that. Even no, no amount at all. <laughs> not a cent, not a nickel. No. <laughs> Mr. President, could I ask you about the uh, your commission on educational excellence today? Uh, uh, made a report saying that there was a tide of mediocrity sweeping. Uh, American schools, and implicit in what they said, I think, is that there will have to be more money spent uh, for longer class hours, better paid teachers, and so forth. Uh, are you, uh, would you be inclined to support more federal aid to education if that's what it took to, to have the kind of crash program that they're talking about? Well, yes, we've talked about that, but providing there would not be any increase in federal administration of those funds. Um, we think there's a parallel between the federal involvement in education and the decline in quality over recent years. But the, uh, what is more needed than just throwing money at education, we're right now spending more money than any other country in the world. We're spending $215 billion on education in this country. Um, we think has happened is, well, the report will speak, speaks for itself, that uh, we have let up, uh, we are not actually uh, taking the students to the limit of their ability. Uh, we think we need more uh, required courses. Uh, this is what the, uh, what the commission has come up with. And I know that today a uh, question was asked of David Gardner as to uh, the one thing that was lacking in the report was the uh, demand for a big federal program. I thought his answer explained it very well when he said, uh, uh, no, we, uh, we are trying to uh, improve the quality of education. Uh, 
uh, and that doesn't take a big federal program. You don't think there's any need for additional federal aid excluding administrative costs? Uh, I have not had a chance to, to read the full report yet, but um, uh, no, I, I don't see any need for it. Mr. President, in connection with your visit with the newspaper publishers tomorrow, yesterday Senator Moynihan told the publishers they should roar like a tiger, I believe he told them, over press restraints on coverage by Congress and the administration. Do you think the press has anything to roar about in terms of covering Washington and your administration? Well, now, how did he just mean that, that they're to roar like a lion? Well, you said that there was a montage of restraint, no major uh, problems, but uh, he referred to the uh, uh, Secret Agents Act, he referred to uh, the appellate uh, power of the Supreme Court, he referred to several incidents, and he said there is a montage of restraint, and the press should be more vigorous and noisy about protecting its ability to cover. I don't see that, and I don't think so. I, I've, uh, I think the press is uh, free to uh, print those things that should be uh, should be printed. Uh, I think to suggest that um, that we uh, should declassify things that with regard to national security would be ridiculous. I think the press would feel that way too. Do you think the public has anything to complain about in terms of what it is getting in the way of news out of Washington and the administration? You know, I'd like to see the press complain about that they're getting too many leaks. That's the, uh, that's, I guess that's your complaint about it. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, one, you've, you've said before frequently that uh, one of the reasons that you're not getting as much support as you should on some of your policies is because the public doesn't understand them. Um, do you think the public is not getting a full account of you? Well, I'm, I'm trying to think of a specific here in, in what we're... Uh, I think defense was... Huh? I think it was the defense buildup that, that, that most recently was oh. complained about. Well, yes, I think there is... I think there has been a perpetuation of an image, of a, of a perception that uh, uh, somehow defense is the uh, cornucopia from which you can get all the revenues you need for anything else that you want to do and that it doesn't have any bearing on our national security. And people have been led to believe that, uh, well, it's just larded with fat and so you wouldn't really be hurting the muscle fiber of our security if you took more money away. And what I guess I suggested recently was that to talk about defense spending, the defense budget, and to talk about, well, let's take five billion off or let's take 10 billion off of the budget. There is no way that you can budget militarily that way. Those of us who are responsible for security, we don't go at how much we want to spend. We go at what do we need to meet the strategic plan that we have, that we believe is necessary for our security. And then you add up what is that going to cost. Now the only way that you can look at the defense budget is not by way of just counting dollars. The man who says uh, uh, let's reduce the budget by $10 billion should be made to come in and look at that defense plan and then we say to him, okay, where do you think, what would you do away with there that would save $10 billion? And how much does that increase the insecurity of, the, of our country if you do that? Do you think then that the public generally just doesn't understand this process? Because the polls still show that, that even though you gained some back in, in recent weeks on this defense spending issues, the polls still show that people believe there can be, that they want a defense buildup, but not necessarily as much as a defense buildup. But they've been want. told that over and over again. You realize that when I was campaigning, during the campaign, it was exactly the opposite. Everyone in this country was prepared to believe and did believe that our defenses had, as we've, as they have, been neglected, and that 
we were in a very risky situation. In fact, much of it was obvious. When ships couldn't sail, naval vessels, because they didn't have enough crew or didn't have spare parts for their machinery, uh, the public knew something was wrong. Since that time, I think the constant drumbeat about uh, charging that there is excessive spending has the thing that has turned the public around. They've been told over and over again that there is waste and extravagance. By Republicans or by the press or by Democrats or what? Who, well, who's let's say a, them that? a combination. Well, uh, your own, your Senate Budget Committee, uh, run by your Republicans, think that you that the point has come where where we have to go for a little bit less of an increase, not a decrease. I understand that, but less of an increase than you want. Well, except that the even including the chairman of that committee are going to wage a fight on the floor but for, seven for more money. They knew they could not, in the committee, they could not get a majority vote. Turning to a topic that is a little maybe less complex, what about uh, Senator Dole's comment yesterday that he doesn't think the public understands the issue with the bankers over uh, withholding tax? Well, I think there that there was a perception built among millions of people that this was a new tax that somehow something that had never been a levied against them was going to be levied. Uh, they did not understand how many of them, the great majority of them, that wouldn't even be touched by this, that they would be exempt on the basis of their income or the size of their savings accounts. And this generated uh, probably the most successful lobbying effort that I've seen in, uh, in many years. Will you, will and, you veto uh, the way it's for, the way the way it's structured now? A four-year delay. Would you veto that the way you would veto? Uh, well, I'm going to wait before I make any comment of that kind of you know, veto or not, till I see what eventually arrives out of the legislature. But the the plain truth of the matter is, this is not a new tax. It's a tax that people are presently paying, uh, and. All that we wanted to do, the same as we do with wages, with withholding, was to be able to head off uh, several millions of people who are cheating on their income tax and are escaping payment by not paying on dividend and interest earnings. Do you think the press has failed to explain this, or do you think it's the fact that the public doesn't want to understand it? Well, I don't know that I've seen that carried very much. I've, I think I've seen the news carried of the, of the lobbying, the news carried of the resentment of this, but I've never really seen an explanation of it. The editorial writers were with you. I don't think I read an editorial anywhere in this country that was, that was not on your side. On I know, the editorials. But then, as we all know, only 10% of the readers read the editorials. <laughs> the 90% were reading something else in the same papers. No, I was surprised at uh, many of the, of the papers that uh, normally don't editorialize in my favor, but we're in this one. Could I ask you a couple of questions about 84 uh, without expecting you to announce while we're sitting here? Uh, but you can if you want. One, <laughs> one of the state chairmen who was having lunch with you last Thursday, uh, when he left the White House, he told some friends at the Republican National Committee that during the lunch you had leaned over and said to him, uh, don't worry, I'm going to go again. And uh, I was just wondering if he was telling the truth. Have you told anybody that? I did not tell anyone. You haven't told anyone? No. You're still, say you're still saying you haven't made up your mind? I haven't said that to anyone, really. Well, even another... Nancy? Uh, even Nancy? Even Nancy. Uh, secondly, uh, one of your sort of supporters, uh, Terry Dolan from NICPAC, occasional supporters. I don't know if you have heard about this or not, but they are running television commercials uh, now saying that, uh, that the press is slinging mud at you and is trying to drive you out of running for a second term. And they are actually collecting money and they're asking for contributions to NICPAC on your behalf for, for running for re-election. Are you aware of this, and do you condone no. or encourage this kind of activity? This is the first that I'd ever heard of it, and no, I couldn't condone it, because uh, 
the election laws are very strict about that sort of thing. Do you feel that the press is trying to get you out of the campaign for running for re-election? No. You, you just think you wouldn't have all those things to pick on if I weren't here. <laughs> In that connection, Mr. President, you always commented that, uh, that, sometimes, that there's an imbalance of bad news over good news. Uh, lately, since the economic news has been brightening, I haven't sensed that feeling quite as much. Do you feel that the news has gotten better or the coverage has gotten better? Well, for one thing, the news has gotten better. But, uh, no, I think I was probably speaking more there of the, of the media, the, uh, the TV news that... Uh, I think sometimes is, is interested in, well, you know, show business uh, is based on the audience having an emotional experience. And so the, the sad stories were, uh, were appealing and so forth, and uh, there seemed to be a great emphasis on this. But, for example, just the other day, though, let me, the use and non-use of figures the other day, there was a little note, uh, and I can't recall, so I'll be honest, I can't recall whether it was a columnist or whether it was a, a news story, to the effect of um, that uh, someplace a record, of, that we're setting a record of 500 uh, uh, businesses uh, going belly up uh, every year, and this year there will be 500 and so forth. But no mention was made of the fact that new businesses are setting records in starting. That in the same period uh, uh, when several thousand uh, uh, businesses were reported as closing, I guess in the year 1982, 600,000 businesses started up. And, uh, and the same was true for a long time. Every week, uh, faithfully reported, was uh, how many people left or how many people signed up for unemployment insurance. But each week, the same source of information gives the number of people that uh, go off unemployment insurance. Now, admittedly, maybe not all of those go back to work. Maybe they just come to the end of their term. But uh, for many weeks, the number of people leaving unemployment insurance has been greater than the number of people going on. So, you know, speaking of the good economic news, some experts think that part of the beginning of the recovery is due to uh, Paul Volcker um, loosening up a little bit on the money supply. Why do you want to get rid of him now? <laughs> the way you ask that question, you can't get a yes or no answer to that. Uh, there's never been any discussion over here of this. I know that's an appointment that comes up down the road a ways. There's never been any talk here. You Come mean on. you mean when you're saying here you mean yourself, not your senior aides, or are you including in your senior aides? On well, the, there certainly has never been any involving me, or no one has ever broached the subject to me. So if you're so if they're saying that, um, as I've seen reported, that um, they're almost unanimous in thinking you should get your own man in that job, that's their opinion and not necessarily yours. That would be their opinion. It's speaking of the aides, just one more. Um, do you, do you intend to do anything about the feuding that's going on among some of the senior levels on your staff? Yes, I'm disturbed about it, and I think there again, this comes under the subject generally of leaks. Um, and I think it's time to, to put a stop to what I think is uh, incorrect information. If leaks are, are honest, that's one thing, but incorrect information is added to this whole atmosphere. How are you going to do that? Well, I've thought of the guillotine. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'll stop short of that. You, it's, do you, is it incorrect, the reports that, that um, Clark and Weinberger, or Clark and Weinberger and Baker, or whatever. I mean, what, which, is that, is it incorrect that, for instance, the defense people and, and Jim Baker and his staff are not uh, communicating as well as they should? Well, whether someone in the lower down 
echelons, thinks they're doing a service for uh, their own shop in uh, putting out this kind of talk or not. That's what I aim to find out. But no, the, uh, uh, I think some of the attacks that I have seen recently uh, uh, both ways are reprehensible and uh, do not portray the situation. So they're not few. No. Any time, no, any time that uh, maybe some of this comes from the way I chose to do business. It's the way I did it in California for eight years. I understand that in the past, um, cabinets, for example, uh, each person had his own turf and no one else in the cabinet would talk about a decision affecting the turf of that one cabinet member. I don't do business that way. I, ours is more like a board of directors. I want all the input, because there are very few issues that don't lap over into other areas. Um, can you talk about farm exports without being involved uh, with the Department of Commerce and the okay. Treasury Department and so forth? So I want everybody's input. I want to hear all the views and all the input. And then I make the decisions. The only thing different from the Board of Directors is I don't take a vote. I know that I have to make the decision. Well, one of the problems is, is that there was a feeling that uh, you could have gotten a better deal out of the budget committee if the issue of, of what your negotiating position was going to be. As an old negotiator, you didn't want to say too soon. Well, it appears that it may have come too late. Do, do you? No, what really happened was we had asked, I had asked for more time to see if, uh, number one, if the commission uh, was studying the MX and all. They had not come in. Whether what they came in with might change the figure that we had put in in the budget. Also, the swift drop in inflation, uh, I, we thought had made some changes. And it takes time. There again, we come back to, you can't just discuss money, you gotta discuss what are we talking about? What are we, what are we talking about doing away with or that won't cost as much and so forth. And frankly, I had asked for time because I believed that we could have some flexibility, that our original figure could be changed. And the committee was in markup and meeting. And I asked for more time again and they wouldn't give more time. And the only reason I was asking for more time was it took longer than we thought. They were working on it over the Pentagon and they came in with a figure and it was a lower and a compromise figure. But it was too late. They had passed their figure. Now we're going to try to get our figure, which isn't as low as theirs, we're now going to try to get it considered. The 7.5? Hmm? The 7.5%? 7, 7 mm-hmm. Mr. President, you mentioned, you mentioned a showbiz and an emotional experience. Does that suggest that you distinguish between the coverage you get in print and on television? Well, I think I'd be quoting an awful lot of newspaper men if I said that, that there is a flavor of show business more to, the, to uh, TV news than there is to the front page of a newspaper. Does that bother you? What? Does that bother you? Not when it's in my favor. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, if I could get back to Mr. Volker just for a minute, I think it was the Chairman of General Motors who said yesterday that, that this thing shouldn't be left hanging, uh, that uh, it could have a powerful effect on Wall Street, you know, the way they perceive what's going to happen here with the Federal Reserve. Uh, most people assume that nothing around here happens by accident. Uh, was it an accident that some of your aides set the tone for perhaps pushing Mr. Volcker out? Does that concern you? If they did, and if those leaks, if, if they actually were leaking this, uh, then it had to be. As a matter of fact, uh, I told Mr. Volcker just the other day, after all of this flurry appeared, that there had been no decision made nor no conversation of any kind carried, carried on here in the administration about this. And uh, I hope he won't mind my telling you his answer. His answer was to laugh and say, I've been around to Washington a long time, don't worry. Well, usually, as, as Don was saying, it's because you're trying, trying it out on the public. I mean, you know, there's leaks and there are leaks, and some of them are 
or help you because you get policies. Well, they, these, this one wasn't one of Believe those. me, these would not have been what you're talking about are leaks of trial balloons. Yeah, no, okay. there were no trial, trial balloons. Because if it was a trial balloon, I would have had to know about it. You want to get one more? Mr. President, I'd like to make a uh, pitch that uh, you and your associates consider sending a message on leaks and news coverage to the Convention of the American Society and newspaper editors. I expect you don't want to visit with two newspaper groups in two weeks, but we hope somebody from your administration can visit with us, and I'll leave this with uh, Mr. Speaks. Oh, all right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Well, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A pleasure. Thanks very much. You bet. Yeah. So, I appreciate it. Are you all ready for your speech? Uh, I hope. <laughs>